This is episode number 123 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. But first, before we get started, let's have a quick chat about our sponsor, Luth AR. Luth AR is home of the MBA buttstocks, which are affordable, lightweight, fully adjustable buttstocks for your AR-15 fixed and collapsible rifle. But that's not all. Luth AR is your one-stop shop for build kits, replacement parts, and custom accessories, including the chubby grip, palm hand guards, oversized switch safety, and paddle bolt catch. Luth AR is proudly made in the USA and with four decades of experience, will continue their mission of innovate to dominate with high quality products for your ARs. Find out more at luthar.com. Well, today we're violating the gun writer's solemn vow of secrecy as we discuss the dirty secret nobody wants to admit. That being, even shooting professionals have a negligent discharge once in a while. The key is following the four safety rules to make sure an accident doesn't turn into a tragedy. Now here's Roy Huntington, Tom McHale, and myself, our collective otherwise known as the Gun Cranks, as we discuss negligent discharges. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Well, this is going to be an interesting episode, I think. I'm going to violate the gun writer code. And thousands of gun writers across the country are screaming right now, no, 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 but I'm going to do it. And I had to invite you guys because I know you don't take yourselves too seriously. So we're going to we're going to break that code and we're going to admit today publicly we have had negligent discharges. Okay, it's a fact of life. They say there's two kinds of shooters, those who have had negligent discharges and those who are going to and. Anybody that's been shooting very long at all has had one. So we're going to talk about it with the idea of we'll probably have some fun and there's some really good safety lessons. Guys, I'll ask you straight up. You ever had a negligent discharge? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Tom, I know something about your kitchen table that we'll talk about in a minute. (laughs) I certainly had one. And also, I have to say, Brent, I'm relieved because I thought you were going to tell them the truth about the distances we shoot guns at and then take pictures of the groups. I'm not going to get that crazy. (laughs) Three (laughs) yards, right? Don't lose your mind. Yeah, At the normal (laughs) combat distance of one yard. Yep. You know, yeah. <laughs> we got a five shot group of 3.5 inches. <laughs> exactly. Well, before we get started and I go round the horn and when we all hear these stories, I, I do want to say one thing is I call them negligent discharges, NDs. And I like that because when you say accidental discharge, it was an accident. The gun was just laying there and it went off and, you know, and that's not the case. Negligent discharge is more accurate because you have to do something except in that one in a trillion instance where the gun is mechanically deficient and it somehow goes off on its own. Otherwise, in 99.9999999% of the time, somebody's doing something usually stupid with the gun and it goes off. So I say just remove the term AD or accidental discharge from your vocabulary because somebody did something to cause the gun to go off. So that's that's where I'm operating from is the terminology of a negligent discharge. So do you guys agree or disagree? I agree with you. I mean, I, I think an AD would be for a while. There were certain there's a certain bolt action hunting rifle made <laughs> by a large uh, company. <laughs> Good point. And if when it was cocked, if you took the safety off, it would shoot. Bango. Yeah, and I I would have trouble calling that a negligent discharge because True. you were truly without fault. Yeah, you know you expected where the but where the the negligent part is is if you're pointing it at your hunting partner when you take the safety off. Exactly. Well, that that brings up a great point. I mean the the four rules of gun safety are deliberately overlapped. You know you have to violate more than one for something really bad to happen, right? Exactly. Just as you just said, it's true. Well, because they always say, what's the 
what are the the loud what's the loudest sound you'll ever hear which is a bang when you expected a click yep or a click when you expected a bang and that goes with the whole nd thing <laughs> well guys let, let's get into confession time and and i'll i'll have host privilege here and i'll go last so I can maybe change up my story as we get to me. But Roy, you've been shooting the longest of the three of us. Surely you have an indie story or two, maybe? Absolutely. I'm 46 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was 21 years old. I think I'm for, yeah, 40. I think that's right. And uh, newly married, and we lived in a small house in San Diego. And I was a complete gu- insane gun guy, you know, a reserve police officer in Chula Vista. And I had a, a seven and a half inch barrel Ruger Super Blackhawk 44 Magnum, which I loved dearly, reloaded for with a Lee loader. And I had a room in our house that was a dedicated reloading and gun room. And uh, my wife was gone for the day. And uh, I was getting ready to go a coyote hunting the next day. And so I had been dry firing this Ruger super Blackhawk at a thumbtack on the wall when just sitting there testing the trigger pull and doing all the things that we do. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to be carrying this new holster that I had for it. And so I put the holster on and then I thought, well, you know, it's a lot heavier when it's fully loaded and I didn't want the holster to be poking at me or so. So I loaded it, put it in the holster and so I walked around the house for a little while and I thought, okay, no, this will be okay. I'm comfortable. Right. So I went back to my gun room and took the gun out of the holster and then thought, you know, I'll dry fire this maybe just a couple more times. So that's when I broke the first rule, which is treat all guns as if they're loaded. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, then I broke the rule about don't point it at anything you're not willing to destroy. And then I broke the next rule, which was be sure of your backstop and what's behind it. Right. I probably broke the fourth rule too. <laughs> you know, your finger on the trigger till the till sights, sights are on, on the target. target. No, yeah. that was okay. Cause I waited till my sights were on the target. So yeah. the, uh, the wall with the thumbtack was foolishly pointing toward the front of the house, which was toward the living room, oh. which also went out into where the tra- the court was. We were on a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? You know, like a, a court where all the houses yeah. are, right? A circle. And so I cocked the hammer. I aimed at the thumbtack as I pulled the trigger and it tripped it and the hammer was falling. I swear to you that it went very slow. And the entire time the hammer was falling, <laughs> I was thinking, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the gun recoiled. And uh, I didn't hear a single thing. I did not hear it go off oh, at wow. all. Uh, and of course, it was unbelievable. The feeling was unbelievable. Uh, mm. for, so for a few seconds, I just was stunned. I yeah. just, I was embarrassed. I couldn't believe I just did this. I knew what happened. So now I was terrified to see what happened. So I went into the other room, which was a bedroom. And there was a both sliding closet doors were both on the same side. And there was this gaping splayed hole through them. Uh, uh, and it smashed a hanging planter and a remember macrame hangers. It was in a macrame hanger there. So I looked at the other wall and there was a key holding bullet, perfect bullet profile in the drywall. Wow. <laughs> about an inch above my then wife's $1,000 fast sewing machine. So I missed that. The sobering thing is it would have hit her had she been sitting there. Yeah. So I'm first to admit all this stuff, stupid mistake. So then I went into the living room, terrified that I was going to see the window at the other side of the house broken out. Uh, but we had an upright piano and I looked at the front of the upright piano <laughs> and it wasn't exploded. <laughs> and so I pulled the piano away from the wall and the, uh, uh, the paneling, the terrible cheesy, you know, seventies pan paneling there yeah. was splintered out and I recovered the bullet, uh, embedded sideways in the back of the big, like, I don't know what, like an eight by eight piece of Oak at the yeah. top of the keyboard, you know, the piano where and the anchor, the wires. Yeah. And, uh, and I sat, I, I went down to my knees. I was so weak need. Yeah. Wow. It was unbelievable. And at that moment, I remember vividly thinking I'm going to sell all my guns <laughs> and I'm never going to shoot again. I don't want anything to do with this or yeah. anything. And it was such an experience. It was unbelievable. 
And, uh, oh, and my wife was <laughs> worked at a bank and she used to have to wear these little uniforms at the bank. And mm -hmm. they, the bullet went through all of her uniforms that were in the closet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, so wow. I was scoring a lot of brownie points that day. <clears throat> anyway, true story. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Uh, and it absolutely changed my life and my way I've handled guns, <clears throat> excuse me, ever since then. And I keep the bullet, which I showed you guys. Uh, I keep the bullet on my desk. And so for the last 41 years, I actually see that bullet every day. Uh, I used to keep it in my medicine cabinet. So when I would open the medicine cabinet, I would see the bullet every single day. So true wow. story. So there you go. Top that. <laughs> I like your, I like your reminder of keeping the bullet out. Yeah. Yeah. Just, Cause you know what the, this is, this is going to get real judgy real fast. Cause you know, the world is full of perfect people who could never make a single mistake or have a lapse in concentration. Right. But yeah, yeah. I'm sure um, we'll hear about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, I see the reason I said I'd never had one because I really would prefer to think that I was automating the process of refinishing my dining room table <laughs> with snake shot. <laughs> Leave it to Tom. <laughs> wow. Snake no, shot. It, you know, it, a similar, similar situation, just a complete and total. Con well, how would I describe it? Concentration failure. And as you know, it only takes a second. I have a, um, a Ruger single six and I generally keep it loaded with um, snake shot. We got a lot of water moccasins around here and um, I had it out one day and I, you know, I unloaded everything, just kind of give it a little clean and buff and uh, the usual maintenance, you know, get the household lint off and all that. And uh, I was playing with it and um, I think I was in the uh, dining room area and like you, I think, you know, going back, I still haven't pieced together exactly how I did it, but I think kind of like you described at some point I reloaded the thing, got distracted. I don't know if it was a phone call or a dog or whatever, and, uh, continued, you know, playing with the gun, you know, drew back the hammer, had it kind of pointed down at a 45 degree angle at our table. <laughs> 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 and next thing I know, uh, Big loud noise. The dog about, you know, jumps out of her paws on the other side of the house from the, uh, the, the gun, even a 22 is kind of loud inside the house. Yeah. And uh, I'm sitting there staring at a, at a brand new pebbled area on our very <laughs> nice and shiny <laughs> wooden dining room table. And, uh, it just crazy. Just one little lapse in, in concentration mm -hmm. is all it takes. Exactly. Awful. How'd you feel right up? Yeah. Awful. This, this one, you know, 22 with snake shot pointed at a table to had uh, a, a less potential overall damage. Now that wasn't planned. I'm not saying that made it any better, um, but um, awful, you know, scared the living crap out of me. Not, not just not the noise and not the event itself, but the thought of how did I just do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Cause I'm the, I'm like, yeah, I'm the fanatic, you know, loaded gun, trigger off, finger off the trigger, blah, 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 blah. And here I am just handling a gun and, you know, dry fire thing. And whoops, it was loaded. Humbling Guns always loaded. So, so embarrassing. Yeah. That that's the hard part for me is once you've figured out that nobody died, it's like, how can I be that ignorant, stupid, insert whatever word you want. It's very humbling. It's, it's awfully mm -hmm. humbling. Get you right off that pedestal. I'll tell yep. you that right now. Yeah. Good. Good lesson, though. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. um, you know, I used to think I was careful about checking a gun before I because I do a lot of dry fire stuff. Right. Now. I mean, you know, yeah, we're we, we uh, handle constantly guns testing guns and checking the triggers and all that stuff. And uh, I used to think I was careful, but now I'm border borderline fanatical about that. Like finger doesn't go on a trigger unless I just check the chamber again, you know, within yeah. one second of, of doing so. Yep. So. You got to do that. Yep. You become like a person who used to smoke and then they stop smoking. And so they yeah. are the most, you know, rabidly anti-smoking and, you know, in the world. And, and I know that's how I am with gun safety. Sorry, no, zero tolerance way mm -hmm. before anything even happens. I mean, yep. is, I mean, if I'm going to have three or four people shooting in the backyard, guess what we do first? First, we talk about the safety rules and then there's always a range master. And at first people find that silly, 
It's like, well, Uncle Fred's not a range master. Yes, he is today. Yep. Uncle Fred, yeah. it's your responsibility that everyone is safe. And if somebody moves the muzzle where they shouldn't be, you have to intervene. And it always works out well. Well, my story is uh, not as dramatic as you guys, but I think it was maybe perhaps more humiliating. I was at Gunsight, Guns- world famous Gunsight Academy, where my best friend runs the show. And I was there for a media event, and I don't remember exactly what was going on, but we were doing some new iteration with a new gun. It was a uh, 1911 style, and somehow I got fuzzy-brained enough that they were having us do something, and was we were preparing and making ready, I slipped the thumb safety off and cranked around downrange in front of everybody. Oopsie. Now, <laughs> those gun writers. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you, okay, make ready. Pow. That, that split second of silence afterwards is the most deafening <laughs> yes. sound in the world. And I mean, it, it, nobody got hurt. The round went down range, skipped off, you know, and went off into the ether. No harm, no foul. But the, the humiliation, and I still to this day, I think it was a sympathetic squeeze thing. I think. But I, I obviously violated uh, one rule. I had my finger on the trigger, and I am a Nazi about that, having taught a lot of folks. So uh, my takeaway from that is even I, who have countless presentations, and it, I wasn't even stressed out. I mean, I've I've done that kind of training a lot. I was with friends, basically, media people. But to crank around downrange in front of everybody at gunsight, it's... Okay, I, I'm I'm going to leave now because I'm a freaking idiot. And you know, the only thing to do this put your hand up and say, "I am a freaking idiot." Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. My brother coined a phrase, and it and I, I laughed when he said it because he meant it about himself. He says, "You can't justify your own stupidity." <laughs> and when you have an AD like that, you just have to own it. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I I re own mine. Every time we set the table for a company or a party or whatever, my my wife is more than happy to remind me of, of my ND. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, look, you can still see it. It's still there. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Familiarity breeds, you know, contempt, they say. But I think, Tom, you summed it up beautifully. Is it, we are, I mean, a day doesn't go by that I don't have probably a half a dozen different guns in my hand, mm-hmm. you know, taking pictures and shooting and writing or whatever. I know you guys are the same way. And, but you can't, you can't get familiar, you know, yeah. you, you can't allow yourself to assume anything, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually glad you brought this topic today um, because every day, you know, I, we get a lot of, a lot of input every day, whether online or forums or email, whatever I hear from people who say, I would never do that. <laughs> I have processes. I have, I concentrate, right. I do this. And you know what? If that if you're one of those, stop right now. Full stop. We are human beings and human beings are imperfect machines, right? Yep. You will have a lapse in concentration. You will have an imperfection. You will make a mistake. You know, saying that you won't because you're somehow absolutely perfect is is a naive and ridiculous thing. So so take lessons, you know, take uh, take lessons from these kind of stories from, from other people to to avoid it yourself. Just remember, the Titanic was designed by hundreds of engineers and was guaranteed to be unsinkable. We saw how <laughs> yep. that worked out. That's true. I mean, well, you know, and I think never violate the rule about the pointing muzzle in a safe direction mm-hmm. because you can violate all the other rules if you want to. And you're just going to be embarrassed and there's going to be a loud noise and you're going to have to, you know, replace the TV set or something. But as long as you don't violate that rule, if you have an AD, it's you're, something you're going to live through. And so will somebody else. Have you ever had somebody who when you, you, you're at a gun store, for instance, and they they're looking at a gun next to you and, and they muzzle you? Right. They're holding it in their hands. They're probably pointed sideways at you. Gun and, shows. Gun shows are yeah, well, horrible I, for that. I always reach over. I push the muzzle out of the way and I always say, oh, hey, watch your muzzle. And almost invariably they go, well, it's OK. It's unloaded. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, every once in a while, I've had somebody say, oh, geez, I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, that's the proper answer. Right. Yeah. But yeah. And d- so don't tolerate it either. Don't stand by and be embarrassed to intervene. You intervene, be the bad guy if you need to, but intervene. Well, especially the friends, because I see that a lot. 
you know, guys are, I, I see it in the hunting field. Hey, you're muzzling me. And they get pissy. Yeah. Well, too bad. Because I'll be the one that catches that, you know, load of bird shot at eight feet, which will not do my profile any good. And they'll just have yep. to deal with it. Yeah. I don't understand why they get offended and defensive. You know, it's like you made a mistake. If you stepped on your buddy's foot, you know, you'd say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? say, it's okay. It wasn't loaded. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. It wasn't. I didn't use my whole weight, you know. <laughs> well, let's do, go. Ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, do we dare talk about interesting ADs we've seen or heard about? That's that's exactly where I was going. You, you've read my mind, Roy. And I'll start on this one. We were teaching a class and... We were at the range, and it's one of these. We got a range building, and it's got an, a big attached uh, canopy where uh, the folks can set up, put their gear with picnic tables. And when everybody first gets there, we tell them there's a here's a designated manipulation and loading area facing downrange. No guns are out in the picnic table area under the cover. Well, I'm standing there, and my job at this particular class was when they were getting ready for the first shooting uh, event. I was to watch them. And I was looking 15 degrees left and about 15 degrees off my right. Pow! Everybody stopped, freak out. And, of course, I'm losing my mind because I'm thinking it's crowded. We're shoulder to shoulder. There's dead people here. Well, fortunately, it wasn't. But here's the cool part. You want to guess who committed the negligent discharge? My chief of police. <laughs> Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> of course, I couldn't smirk or anything, but it's like, Let's put the gun away now, okay? <laughs> so I loved that one. That was fantastic. Other than I think it took five years off my life, because for that split second, I thought we've got multiple dead people here. And had he not been pointing the gun in a safe direction, um, you know, and it was one of those, he was just messing around. He was loading it or something, I forget. But um, by the, the grace of God or just pure luck, he was he was pointing downrange. So the round just went downrange. If he had been any other direction we'd had a mass casualty multiple gunshot wounds so mm -hmm. it was funny but not I, well that's a I great first... story to oh i'm sorry the, okay. to illustrate the 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 power of muzzle control because i was going to say something i see a lot on a regular basis is the inadvertent second shot you know mm. at a range and i've had them too you guys probably have as well you know testing a new gun or something and you shoot once and then like whoa light trigger or sympathetic squeeze or whatever it was you know you launch another shot into the target area uh without fully intending to yeah uh, i mean that's a that's a regular event but yeah you know hey if, if uh if you focus on your muzzle control and your muzzle discipline it's pointed at the right place so. yep yeah it's just a loud noise when i first went to thunder ranch and this would have been 93 i think or 94 is when i was introduced to the term a fiddle table and so on every range uh, Clint had had a wooden bench that was pointed in a safe direction. And if you were manipulating your gun other than on the line, loading, unloading and shooting and reholstering anything else, you had to go do it over at the fiddle table and whoa, be the person who was in the parking lot, you know, doing yeah. something in his trunk. And uh, so I adopted that. And when I have more than one person in the backyard shooting with me, I bring out a little folding table, move it to a corner of the, of the uh, patio there, point it in a safe direction. And the rule is if you're manipulating your gun and you're not standing here right next to me shooting, then it's over there on the table pointing in the other direction. And you know what? People are like kids. If you give them direction, then they're happier. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, they know, Oh, these are the rules. Okay. I can you know play within the rules. And so that's a actually not a bad idea, regardless, especially if you have kids I have a fiddle table. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to I, I don't mean to exclude you, Tom, but I am going to speak to our current and former law enforcement officers. If you've been in law enforcement more than 15 minutes, you've walked into the locker room. And Roy, <laughs> what has happened in every single locker <laughs> uh, squad locker room in every police department in America? You know, when I first got hired on the San Diego Police Department, I was assigned to Central Division, which was the main facility. So we probably had, I don't know, four, three or four hundred officers there at least. And so they had a huge uh, we locker room. Right. And we had these old school metal lockers, you know, that you used to have in high school. And we were kids and stuff. And uh, the first thing that hit me when I walked through the locker room was that I saw bullet holes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I thought, well, this isn't what supposed to, I didn't know it was going to be like this, you know? So, <laughs> but as the years went by, I, I was assigned to our Eastern division and traffic division and graveyard was securing. So, you know, after graveyard, you just want to get out. Yeah. It's like, I am done. You're already asleep. And so we, there was about maybe 25 of us in this locker room. And, uh, and, and you know how it is too. There's a lot of, everyone's laughing and joking and telling stories about what happened that night and you know, what they were going to do in the day. And so we we're all doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden we hear the shot <laughs> <laughs> you know, bang. And we had revolvers at the time. And I remember distinctly, of course, like you said, it gets absolutely quiet, <laughs> pin drop quiet. And I remember vividly looking down because it happened on the other side of some lockers from me. And I remember I saw this little whiff of smoke <laughs> come up <laughs> above the top of the lockers. <laughs> and then so I leaned over and I looked down the aisle. And then at the other end, there were a half a dozen heads looking back up the aisle at me. <laughs> and in the middle was this guy we knew, and he's holding a six inch Model 10 down. Uh, at his open locker door, right? <laughs> and we all looked at each other and it was the fastest mass exodus <laughs> that you have ever seen in your life. I mean, we were gone. Yep. <laughs> and uh, nobody heard anything. Gosh, no, Sarge, I wasn't. It must happen after I left. I don't know. Right? You know? <laughs> so, exactly. But it gets better. He shot through his aluminum posse box. Remember the old report yeah. boxes that you had to hold all the report forms? He shot through his aluminum posse box and then hit his vest, which was laying in the bottom of his locker. So he had to deal with that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's funny. You go into police locker rooms, any place, and I don't understand this myself, but generally there'll be a big mirror in there. And a lot of times there'll be a, there'll be a hole in that mirror. And if it didn't <laughs> shatter, they didn't replace it. And uh, I remember our old bathroom, uh, and it was like a, a medicine cabinet sized mirror. And right before I came on, somebody was doing the quick draw, practicing a head shot. <laughs> he put it right through the center there, and it was real thick oh, mirror, Lord. so they just left it in place. So. Oh, Lord. Can I tell one more short one? Sure. I was working graveyards. You hear shots fired, right? Cop gets on the air. Shots fired. Yeah. Got shots fired here. Okay. Woo, woo, woo. Everybody gets excited. Where are you? And here and there, and everything's going. So I was one of the first two or three guys to get to this scene, and his windshield had had a bullet hole in it. Right. And he's standing next to his car and he's like kind of shaky and red faced and all that. And we're saying, well, well you know, what happened? You know, where's the bad guys and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm a gun guy. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking and all of it's very obvious that this is a bullet hole that came from inside of the car <laughs> through the windshield. Yeah. And all of this spalling was out across the hood of the car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, And so I, I got on the air and I said, you know, everyone can disregard, you know, we have a supervisor to respond to the scene. I pulled this guy who I knew a little bit to the side and I said, you know, it's, you really need to just say what happened here. Yeah. You know, I said, you're around with your gun. Or, I mean, messing around with your gun <laughs> and it accidentally fired. Right. And he was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. True story. Everybody learns the hard lesson. Well, I, I've got a fun one along those same lines. I was the day shift supervisor, and it was a quiet Saturday morning, so we'd all kind of adjourned back to the police station, and I was walking down the hall, and we had a call at the bullpen where the guys were all hanging out, check their mail, check the computer, blah, blah, blah. I walked by, and there's this knot of guys, and they're looking at one of the guys' Glocks. I didn't think anything about it. We've got good handgun safety training and all that, and they were pointing it in a safe direction. So I go down the hall, I turn the corner into a big hallway, and it's Saturday, so there's no admin or anything, so it's kind of, you know, your footsteps are echoing on the terrazzo, and I hear a pow. And, again, that split second, you know, I have that dialogue, self, I believe that was a gunshot. Ah! So I turn around, <laughs> and as soon as I skid the corner down that hallway, I see smoke rolling out of the officer's room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, you know, first of all, I'm the supervisor, so it's my problem if anything happened. Second of all, these are all my friends. I, I'm, oh my God, somebody's probably dead. So <laughs> I go running down the hallway, literally, you know, like the cartoon skid to a stop and look in there and guys are <laughs> intently looking in their mailboxes, looking at books on the shelf. <laughs> and one of the guys who is now might be the chief now is typing on the computer. And I said, what in the hell happened? And he cool as a cucumber turns to me and goes, uh, I don't know. What did you hear? 
<laughs> and one of the guys had picked that glass and we questioned him extensively of course we had to write it up and do reports but he goes i don't know i knew it was loaded i just wanted to feel the trigger pull so i cranked around off and the round went through the desk hit the wall and and stopped but as soon as that happened the guy who was on the computer there was a blotter you know a, a desk blotter that there was some stuff sitting on he just slid it over two inches and covered the, <laughs> the bullet hole and I was just so amazed. They all immediately just, because they couldn't leave, you know, yeah. they knew I just walked by. So they're all just, you know, looking at, at the walls and looking at books and no, well, what did you hear? <laughs> That's quick thinking on your feet. That's That goes with that demand, deny everything, demand proof and make counter accusations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tom, you ever had a bit of excitement occur next to you? <laughs> hey, I, I wouldn't call it a, uh, I would call it a negligent loading. Uh, station next to me at the range, a, um, a new shooter who was there with a buddy of his popped a magazine full of 300 blackout into a standard 223 AR and pulled the trigger. Um, There's fun. So certain 300 blackout bullet profiles will chamber, you know, in a 223 barrel just enough uh, for things to operate. So wow. he blew up wow. a rifle, you know, a couple of feet away. And, uh, it was, it was quite exciting. I mean, it, uh, the receivers, you know, blown apart, bent the barrel bulged and bent. I mean, that was, we're talking, uh, uh, pretty significant event right there. Yeah. Good lesson in that. Well, you know, that, that, a uh, whole nother topic there is the almost Indies. And I was talking about a story that makes me sick. This was not an ND, but had it been an ND, I might have died. And it was one of those, you know, if you're not familiar with this concept, you really need to ingrain it in your head that if you go to drop a gun, especially a handgun, let it go. Let it go to the ground. I know it was a $5,000 custom Nighthawk. Let it go to the ground. And I'm living proof of this. I had a cocked and locked 45, and somehow I got fumble fingered and I dropped it. And I went to grab it, and you know what had happened? It's down about waist level. I grabbed the gun. My thumb went in the trigger guard, and it was pointed right at my midsection. Oh. Fortunately, I hadn't had the thumb safety off yet. If I had had that thumb safety off, I'd have shot myself right in the middle. Oh. So, and we would be having this conversation with someone else. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, same kind of thing. I was thinking, uh, and I'm sure all of you guys have seen this. You got shooters on a line in, a, in like a basic class, and you, you. I learned this after the first time. You have to be careful. Hey, your your uh, earphones are not on. People will reach up with their pistol, oh, and yeah, point their yeah. gun at their head. As, <laughs> no, <laughs> I've actually, I've seen that too. Unbelievable. Yeah. I remember one. He came up and he kind of had it pointed to the rear. I could see right down the barrel. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> right down the barrel. Oh, not a good day. But closing this up, we've we've had a great discussion of negligent discharges. I think the big big thing we keep going back to is those four rules. You got to do the four rules, and like Tom says, and the more of those you violate, the worse it's going to be. So don't do that. Yep. I think we need to re meet though, and let's talk about some stupid gun things we've seen. Yeah. You know, blowing guns up, and you know, and that kind of stuff. So. And then that way I can tell the story of the policeman who shot the middle of the table during lineup, <laughs> which is a whole nother story. So. Wow. And, you know, I, I think this kind of goes with our central theme of we're, we're breaking the gun writers code by admitting we do things less than optimally because it's like like Tom said, we're human. You're never going to be 100 percent because that's just the way it is being a human. But. I think it's important we, as the quote-unquote experts, admit we've had them. And I think it's important for anybody, kind of going back to what you said, Roy, about if you accidentally muzzle somebody, just apologize. And how many times have you seen NDs and the people, they get angry, well, it's not my fault. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Unless the gun literally has a mechanical failure, and those are few and far between, and you're going to have to prove it. Otherwise, you did something stupid. Just say, my bad. You know, fortunately, nobody got hurt this time, um, but I'm going to learn from it, and I apologize to everybody. But that is typically, especially as guys, we don't do that. Yeah, just to own up to it and apologize. So yeah. hopefully 
everyone's going to have listened to this in the spirit that it was given, which was, I think like a lot of things, just admitting that it's a problem and can happen should open it up for discussion. So Tom, did your wife ever forgive you? Oh yeah. Yeah, she did. She, after the initial shock, she kind of laughed a little bit and just shook her head. You know, you know, that, (laughs) that head shake that you get when you've been married a long time. It's like, okay, (laughs) nice move. You know, Yeah, but 20 years from now, she'll say, and remember that time you shot the table? Oh, yeah. So it, it oh, yeah. never goes It'll away. It'll never go no, away. It's, it hasn't gone away. <laughs> uh, Buddy. Well, guys, thanks for uh, being honest and talking about something that, like I said, as gun riders, we tend not to want to do. But I think that's where maybe the three of us are different or weirder than most gun riders is uh, we're willing to admit we're human, too. But hopefully folks can understand if we can do it, you can do it. So make sure you follow those safety rules, especially if you're dry firing because one trigger pull can change your life uh, very badly. So, guys, thanks for talking to me, and uh, let's get out there and get shooting safely. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. That was Love unanimous. It. That was it, yeah. yeah. We were, we were practicing, huh. you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, as we said, you've either had an ND or will someday, so hopefully our lighthearted look at the problem emphasized why it's important to follow the gun safety rules. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first on the newsstand, and today we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got any questions or comments about the show, please email me. That would be editor at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for purchase on our websites. Most of all, while you're online, I'd really appreciate it if you would also share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Shooting.